is about software and transactional memory. Um, rather a fascinating concept, but um, I'll let Bartosz explain what it is. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so the, the title of the talk, uh, a subtitle of the talk, How D Can Make Concurrent Programming a Piece of Cake. Um, and I was thinking of another one. Um, how I became optimistic about concurrent programming. <laughs> <laughs> Which has double meaning, as, as you will see, because this, this is an optimistic. Uh. OK, so let's start with some obvious things. And I don't want to spend much time, so I just want to make sure that uh, we are on the same uh, page. Uh, Multicore is here to stay, and this is the future, right? Everybody agrees? Show of hands. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, of course, if multicore is here, then programmers must learn to use concurrency seriously, not just w winging it. Lock oriented programming, or as I call it, deadlock oriented programming, is bad. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and those of you who didn't raise their hands, uh, we, sh we should just like worship you because because <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of us, uh, mere mortals, it's it's uh, it's really painful. So let me start with some really really trivial example that everybody understands very well, but I I, I need this example to introduce some ideas and some new ways of thinking about it. Because we, we need uh, a completely new <coughs> framework of thinking about concurrent programming. So this is a, a tiny uh, function, toggle, and um, it, it reads some global variable x and converts it to zero. If it's zero, then it writes one, and if it's one, it writes zero. Or if it's different from zero, then it writes then writes zero. So it just toggles between one and zero, right? And now we go into a multi-threaded environment, and this, this doesn't work anymore. If, if you can access uh, the, the variable x from multiple threads, and they, they both call these functions, then they get into trouble. So let's, let's analyze this uh, in minute detail to see why and how we can manipulate this, right? <coughs> so the first thing that the, that the program does, and I mean the compiled code will actually do, is fetch x from memory, right? Fetches x from memory and puts it either on a stack variable or in a register, right? So we have a cache now. Now we are operating on a cached value. Not the thing that is sitting in memory, but our private thread cache invisible, right? And we compare this cached value to zero. And we say, OK, if it's zero, then uh, let's write one. And the problem with this is that at the moment that we are writing, the value of x could have already changed. And we are, first of all, we are dealing here with a cached value, which is not equal, necessarily equal to what's in memory. And besides, there's a time lapse between when we check it uh, or fetch it, and uh, the time that we, that we are writing. So w the, 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 the error that we are making here is um, that we make this right based on incorrect assumptions. Because this, this program tells us if x is 0, then write 1. So we are assuming, we read this x, we see, OK, it's 0. So our assumption is x is 0, and that's why we write 1. And our assumption got invalidated in the meanwhile. So how can we avoid the, this invalidation of our assumption? This, the, the traditional way is put it inside a lock, lock it. Prevent other threads from changing anything. Then we know that whatever we read, whatever we did the comparison, our assumption is still true, and when we do the right, it's a correct right. 
So let me, let me reformulate it in, in a logical way, is using, using logic. It's like this program is a theorem. It has hypothesis and conclusion. The hypothesis, uh, actually two theorems. One theorem is that if x is equal to 0, which means read x compared to 0, then conclusion x equals 1. Write 1 into memory, right? And the problem is that we make this hypothesis uh, and uh, uh, and check it at some point, and and if the hypothesis uh, is true, then the conclusion is true also, right? When the hypothesis is invalidated, the conclusion is wrong. <coughs> so the way around it would be, hey, so before we do the right, let's recheck our condition, okay? So we do this stuff, but, but we are clever, and we do the recheck. And this is a transactional way of looking up, uh, at this. So first of all, because we are delaying the checking after we do the comparison, uh, then we, we can no longer you know, think uh, of, you know, we, we can no longer store this variable, the value, in invisible cache. We have to store it in some visible cache that we can access to do actual check. You know, we, we, we loaded variable x and it was 0. Later we have to do the check. We compare this 0 to the actual value stored on disk under x. Uh, not on disk, in memory. Right? And we, we compare these two and if it's false then we say, okay, something is wrong. But in most cases, and this is the optimistic way of looking at it, in most cases, it, will, it won't change. So um, our, we, we assume that our conclusion is true, our, our hypo hypothesis is still true, then we reach the conclusion and we do the right. So first of all, the reads have to be put in some storage so that we can later check them. And this storage is called a log. We just have to log all the reads we are doing. In this case, there's only one read, but in more complex code, we do several reads. We put them in storage for later testing, retesting. And then uh, we get to the write part, right? And we cannot start writing until we do the recheck. So before, uh, so, so we cannot make the write at this point, we have to log the right as well. So we have a right log as well. And we just make this virtual right into the log. Then we check our assumptions. We go through the read log, recheck it, right? And then we conclude, OK, everything checked. Then we can do all the writes from our right log. Okay? This might seem like a very complicated way of, of doing this stuff, and probably in the case of this little program, uh, which can be rewritten log-free anyway, uh, it seems like, a, like a, a lot of overhead. But in general, what does this um, thinking give us? What does it buy us? Well, first of all, you will say, wait a minute. So we did the rechecking, and then we do the writing. What if somebody changes the variable after we did the rechecking, right? I mean, I just shoved the thing under, uh, under a carpet. But, but it's actually very good that, that I was able to shove it under the carpet, because I split the problem into two separate parts, right? The first part is called... Um, execution, uh, sort of virtual execution, right? Where, where I'm actually executing user code, and I'm not doing anything permanent to the memory. I'm only logging all the reads and logging all the writes. So it's called speculative execution. Because so far I haven't changed anything. I'm just speculating, OK. If these values are solved, and I will do these writes, and so on, and I'm writing for myself a little, a little uh, list of things to do. And then once, once I'm done executing speculatively user code, then there is a second 
part, which is the commit phase, in which I do my read check and I do my writes. Okay? Why is it so great? Because the second part is generic. It does not depend on what the user code did. It depends only on what the user code logged. So this code that does the commit part can actually be written once and for all and reused in every situation when we have tr a transaction. Okay? I'm calling it a transaction. I mean, under the locking scheme, we would just grab a lock and release it at the end. Here we say, well, let's make it a transaction. And a transaction means let's log everything, let's, let's do it uh, uh, in virtual space, on the side, in separate universe. This is where, what we are doing. Okay? And now let's compare this universe with the reality. And comparing this universe with, uh, with, with the reality is done by some runtime library. So the user doesn't have to worry, the client of this, of this uh, STM doesn't, doesn't have to worry about concurrency when he's writing his code. He's just writing it as, as if a global lock was taken. Nobody's mucking with, with my values. I'm just executing it in my sandbox. Whereas the whole concurrency issue was shoved into the runtime code. The runtime code, for instance, could take a, a lock uh, while doing the read check and while doing the writes and so on to prevent other threads from modifying it. But all the concurrency issues are, are hidden there. And they can be tested and they can be written by people who actually do this for, uh, for money or for, for fame. At the universities, they write articles and, and so on, right? So, uh, so that, that's usually a pretty well-tested code. And, and uh, if there is a bug in it and it got, gets released, then, then users will uh, file bug reports and it will be fixed. But it's much easier to debug one piece of code than let the user debug every piece of code they write that has to be concurrent. Now, what else do we buy? Okay, so user code is much simpler, of course, because it doesn't have to deal with concurrency at all. So, buy by concurrency uh, as a headache. Um, it's less error prone, and um, it is written as if there was a one big global lock, which is the, the very coarse way of, of uh, using concurrency. But it's implemented as if every single word were, were lockable. So the granularity of locking and the granularity of, of uh, uh, concurrency is much smaller. And what it buys us, for instance, that increases concurrency. It, it's, uh, if, if you have two threads, one is accessing this part of the tree and another thread is accessing this part of the tree, they will not conflict. Right? So it is like as if you were locking the, the nodes, not the whole tree. Right? And you know how difficult it is to write concurrent code when you, are, when you have low granularity locking, because so you have multiple locks, you have deadlocks. You, you, I mean, you are begging for deadlocks. So here's STM, Software Transactional Memory, in a nutshell. And, and most of uh, implementation of STM just follow these, these steps. There are different implementation. So you start a transaction, and usually when it's built into the language, starting a transaction means starting a block, an atomic block. So you say atomic, start a block. And this block will be transacted. And, and uh, the, the runtime the compiler will do for you, it will start a transaction, will create a log, and then we'll do the speculative execution, during which it will do some logging, but will not change any memory, any shared memory. And then there's the commit phase at the end of the atomic block, which is also automatic. Uh, and it's atomic, so from the point of view of other threads, you are just like in a blink of an eye exchanging all the values. 
Uh, so you do the read check, uh, check all, all your re read log against memory, and, and then you write your write log into memory, and it's all atomic. Now, of course, this is very optimistic, right? In, and, and in most cases, you are allowed to be optimistic unless there is a tremendous contention. But if there is no tremendous contention, then, then it, it really pays to be optimistic. But you have to be prepared for the worst case, too. So if any part of this fails, for instance, you, cannot, you, you, you do a read check and you find out, okay, somebody modified this value. Well, just say, well, I'll restart everything. I'll abort this transaction and I'll start all over again. So what? It happens once in a million um, instructions or something, or <coughs> once in a second. So, yes? Any number, any number of places, any number of places and does it atomically. I'll talk about the implementation later. Just believe me that it's possible. It's possible to atomically do, I mean, imagine in your mind that you take a global lock and you do the commit phase under a global lock. It's possible, right? Now, how to do it without the lock? That's uh, the genius of, of these people who invented this. Okay, what else? So, so first of all, as we see, user code, trivial to write. The system takes, takes care of, of uh, uh, concurrency. But there's more, there's compos composability. Something that's extremely difficult to do with in the deadlock-oriented program. <coughs> what does it mean? Uh, the simplest example, the traditional example is you have two bank accounts, you and you want to move money from one account to another, right? Now, to get money from an account, you do a transaction of getting money, right? Withdrawal. And uh, withdrawal is, uh, is also a, an operation that many clients will do, so withdrawal has to lock the, the account while it's withdrawing stuff and, and sort of, and also has to do it transactionally. Um, you can do it with locks, you can do it transactionally, it doesn't matter. Um, but it, it's, it's one atomic action. Then with this money you go to another account and also in one atomic action you deposit it. But how to do the whole thing atomically Right? What happens if, you know, you, you take the money uh, out of one account and before you deposit it in another account, some other thread is checking your credit re uh, rating, for instance, and says, oh, this guy has no money, you know? We won't give him a loan, right? <clears throat> and you want to do something uh, that you, you take the money from one account, you deposit it in the other account atomically these two things atomically. So at no point another thread will see, okay, the money is missing from this and missing from this account, right? You want to do this atomically. And, and uh, in deadlock-oriented programming, to, you have to do magic. For instance, you, you have to um, expose the lock to the client. So then the clients say, okay, I'm going to lock this account. I'm going to lock this account, okay, and now do my transaction, and then unlock. And of course, you are begging for a deadlock. Yes, one thread is doing this. First this, first this. And the other thread comes and grab this, and then grab, grab this. <laughs> and they said lock, yes? Well, you could ask just for one lock to unlock uh, the opt operation acquire account. Okay. Uh, Acquire account, m meaning you're exposing, exposing the lock. Yeah. That's, that's the way of exposing a lock, yeah. Then you could um, first acquire the lock, and then you could acquire account one, account two, account three, how many you want, you could change accounts. Oh, you, you mean you, acqu you, you acquire a global lock of the whole bunch of accounts? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 
Yeah. Well, that that that's that's a very coarse granularity. You don't want to do that. Yeah. So you either have to do coarse granularity, or if you are forced to do low-level granularity, you have to acquire multiple logs. Yes. Exactly. No, you don't have to. You, you can also order locks. No, there are, there are things. Yeah, yeah. You can order locks, absolutely. I'm not saying that this problem is not solvable because people solve this problem. It's just, it's, it's so complex and it's so easy to make a mistake. And in, in one operation, you forget that you are supposed to take them in, in some order and, and, and you're screwed, you know? And, and, and uh, whole nights of debugging. I mean, anybody who actually tried to implement something th like this are very well aware of the danger. So, oh, hmm, wait, 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 wait. Um, I, I explained the problem. I didn't explain the solution, okay? This, so, um, so first of all, withdrawal. If we do it transactionally, we'll just say atomic block account withdraw sum. Okay, and that's an atomic withdrawal. The operation that we need in most cases, just one atomic withdrawal. Um, if you want to deposit, you can also write an atomic block and account deposit the sum. But if you want to do a, a move between two accounts, you open the atomic block and you say, account one withdraw, account two deposit. End of transaction. That's it. Atomic means, uh, atomic means uh, start a transaction. So open, open the logs, right? Oh, oh, no, you're not locking anything at this point. <laughs> no, no, let's, let's go through the sort of, uh, to give you an idea how, how, how it works, right? So atomic. You enter the block, you create a log. Now anything that's inside an atomic block is, block is, is not executed immediately. It's executed in a virtual world just by putting stuff in the log, not in the memory. So account one withdraw will not actually withdraw, right? It will say, okay, I read the value of the account and I log the value that I want to put back in there, which is the sum I withdraw. I mean, the sum I was there minus this, the amount I withdraw, right? So if I withdraw everything, you know, I'll, I'll write a zero in there. But I don't write the zero yet. Then I go to account to deposit, and again, I read the value, I add the sum to it, and I write this back, but, but also virtually. It's, it's, it's all speculation right now. So I have these two writes, they have the, these two reads, two writes. And now end of atomic block, I commit. And in one commit operation, one atomic commit operation, I recheck the values I read and, and write the two new values into two accounts. And if the check fails, I just abort the operation and start from the beginning again until I succeed. Make sense? Makes sense, but it's kind of dead loss too again. How? Uh, it's, um, because you have the second thread, which does um, you reverse. Okay. And both start at the same time. Mm -hmm. But they, they can collide only during commit, see, because they are executing in virtual spaces. And if the, 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 the one who, that commits first will change the values that the other one read, and the other one will just fail. The read check on the second one will fail. What if it's a multi-core machine where there's really... really Absolutely, multi-core. One of them will commit. 
one of them will commit. There's always one committing. Because you can abort the transaction only if somebody else commits it. You don't abort a transaction for any other reason but because somebody else committed. And of course, when I talk about the implementation, you'll understand how clever it is done, right? But for now, you know, just believe that the commit is atomic. Yeah. Right. And also because the granularity is so low, the probability that they will actually conflict is, is very small. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, third thing where it's extremely useful to have um, transactional memory. So, composability. It solves the problem of composing things into transactions. Uh, blocking transactions. Uh, and there is only one implementation that actually tested this. Uh, uh, we don't know how difficult it will be to implement it um, in, because they did it in Haskell. And this is D. Uh, so typical example of producer-consumer. Everybody knows how hard it is to actually program this. Yeah, it looks simple in theory, but in practice, it's it's deadlock after deadlock. Um, so you have this producer-consumer queue, and you have producers and consumers. Uh, producers put stuff on the queue. Consumers get stuff from the queue. So if you want to get something from the queue, you, you, you want to get an item from the queue, you just start a transaction, you put it in an atomic block, and you get it, right? So that's how you use uh, the, the, this queue. Uh, but the question is how, is, how is get implemented? And here's a new twist. Because get is implemented uh, to first look whether there is anything in the queue. You cannot get if there is nothing in the queue, right? So, so that's, that's the most difficult part. So what if there is nothing in the queue? <clears throat> well, there's this new thing called retry that I haven't talked about. Um, how does this work? Well, suppose that, that retry will just uh, abort the transaction and then start all over again. It's, it would work. It would work. It would restart the transaction over and over until finally some producer decides to put something in the queue and then it will commit. But of course this would be a tre tremendous uh, um, load on, on, on the processor for nothing, right? So normally it's done in this way that uh, uh, if there's nothing in the queue, you, you just block and wait, right? So you, you want to enter a wait state. Uh, and uh, so how long do you wait? Well, you wait until somebody wakes you up, presumably a producer. So a producer have to, has to be aware that you are blocked, and has to wake you up. So it has to signal something, right? And you have to wake up from your sleep and continue. And then they both have to know what you are waiting for. Right? You are waiting for this count. Now, how is retry really implemented? And that's, that's another amazing thing. OK, retry uh, does restart a transaction, but it doesn't perform it. Um, it, it, um, it saves its read set all the values that were read and logged as in, the re, uh, in the read log, these are the values that, that the, the, the um, transaction read from memory. It preserves this read set and publishes it for everybody to see. And blocks. So it's ready to execute a transaction, right? But it's, it blocks. And now how is it woken up? Well, the consume, uh, uh, anybody who's performing any transaction uh, during commit, after commit, 
uh, at the last moment of the commit, looks up these published lists and, and checks, is my right set, does my right set uh, have anything in common with all these waiting guys, read sets? If it does, that means I have changed something that they read, right? So I wake them up. Because, uh, you know, if I change something that they read and they are blocking because um, they, their logic says, you know, with these values that you read, you cannot continue, so go to sleep, to retry, right? So there is no signal variable, there is no signaling, the consumer uh, blocks on its read set, essentially, waiting for its read set to change. In this case, the read set is just the count of the queue. It's just one word. It's just waiting for this word to change. It hasn't read anything else. It doesn't need to. So it's read the count, and it's, it's, and it's in its read set. So it just waits patiently. And everybody who commits looks, have I changed the count, by the way? If I did, let's wake it up. Yes? No, the retry keyword is there to explicitly do the retry. The, what, what you are thinking about the retrying a transaction when it, when it aborts, that's invisible. That's something that the, the user has no control. It will always retry if, if, it, if it, but, but retry is a special keyword that tells, uh, tells the system that this guy wants to block and retry a transaction later when something changed. Because if nothing changed, then there is no reason to wake up. Yes? Well, that, that, that depends so much on how threads will be implemented in, in D. The bottom line is they heal the thread and so on and then act, actively wake it up. Be it a fiber or, you know, a thread yeah. or, um, There has to be enough uh, information posted on this bulletin board for other threads uh, that they know what to do. A thread ID, wake the thread, you know. It's, it's sort of a, a, a primitive operation to block and wait a thread, wait, wake up a thread. Uh, where am I? Okay, so again, uh, the producer consumer queue is, is solved here in just a few lines of code. There is no explicit the synchronization. There is no explicit the in exchange of, of semaphores or um, signals, nothing. The, the, the producer is actually completely unaware of the fact that somebody is waiting for what he's doing. Producer code is just atomic put and, uh, and atomic. That's it. It just happens so that another thread is waiting on, its, on, on this counter and it's posted there. So the runtime system will, during commit, will look it up and free that, that other thread. So this is very high level of abs abstraction. Okay, let me continue. Um, yeah, okay, well that, that just shows you um, the code, atomic, item one, PCQ, get. Oh, composability, right, right. Not only this retry works uh, but for, for a single operation, but you can combine these operations. This is, this is, a co this is code that uh, says, uh, you know, I need two items to do any useful work, right? Two, not one, not zero, but two. So I have to get two items from the queue. So I should be waiting until there are two items in the queue, right? So how do you code that using locks? You would have to like 
have a special function wait for two, right? Whereas here, you just do two gets, one after another, inside an atomic block. And what happens if, 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 if the queue has zero elements, the first get will block, will retry, right? Will retry, and it's going to wait on the count variable. And when something happens, it will be woken up, right? And suppose that second time it wakes up, there's, only, there's one element, okay? So the first get uh, goes through without retrying. But the second get, which operates inside the same, tra the same transaction, so it sees that the counter has decremented to zero now, virtually, right? It will, it will have to retry. And again, waiting for the counter to change. And these two operations can be composed in a, in a single transaction. This transaction will only exit, succeed when there are two elements in the queue, and it will remove both of them at the same time. If there is, if there. It does, yeah, yeah. It, it does retry the whole transaction. It goes back to the transaction, to, to the first line. No matter whether the first one blocked or the second one blocked, the whole transaction is retried. Yes? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, do you, of course, there there are ways of starving at red. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, and you would probably not design your system this way, you know? I mean, <laughs> I mean you can always write code that's uh, not very economical, you know? It's, I mean, of course, transactional memory will not solve all the problems. And you would probably try to come up with some, some better solution using transactional memory. Okay, so this is retry. And uh, now let's, let's go into the implementation a little bit. There are two major implementations of transactional memory. One is word-based and the other is object-based. Word-based is essentially every word in memory is transacted. So actually every word in memory has um, behind it a version number and a lock. Um, and of course, that's, that's the idea. The, the implementation actually is that uh, you just have a huge array of, of these locks and you have many to one mapping from memory. So like you just block the last five bits or so. And usually it's like 64K um, items in, in this array is enough. And the conflicts are rare. If there is a conflict, then, then the worst thing that happens is you abort a, uh, a transaction that you shouldn't have aborted. But it's an optimistic world, so who cares? Uh, but I, uh, I, I think object-based STM uh, is the way of the future as, uh, in object-oriented languages, of course. Um, and there's one major reason for that, or maybe there are more reasons, but what, well, performance is better. Object-based uh, SDM is, is faster, about a binary order of magnitude. And, um, and there is this problem of um, being able to call library functions from, an, from a transaction. See, because in, in word-based, uh, transactional memory, you have, to, uh, you have to instrument every read. The compiler has to instrument every single read 
inside the block that's uh, transactional. And now when you call something from this block, that something has to be instrumented too, right? So you might have a whole family of functions that are only called inside transactions. You know, you can call them atomic functions. And they, they can only be called from inside a transaction. Um, but, but, you know, the, uh, like the simplest uh, Sterlin, for instance, it, it reads from a string. It would have to log every read in that string. So you'd have to have two versions of Sterlin, one atomic, one non-atomic, and so on. Whereas in object-based uh, uh, transactional memory, you don't have this. You can call anything you want, uh, functions that mod modify your objects, uh, or just do the reads, because they don't have to be instrumented. Uh, on the other hand, there is a little bit more visibility to, um, to the client. So the client has to design data structures in a funny way. Um, but I think it's, it's a price worth paying. So first of all, um, the, the unit uh, of concurrency in, uh, in OSDM is uh, a, an atomic object, or a transactable object. We'll call it atomic object. Um, atomic object can only be visible through a handle. So um, there's no access to the atomic object uh, directly. Um, it's, it's, it's like an opaque handle to, to an object. Um, while you, when you are inside a transaction, you can actually open this handle. And then you get the object back. And then you can modify the object or can read the object or modify. But not outside of the transaction. So this object is totally protected from concurrency because nobody can use it outside of transactions. So, you know, there is no danger that somebody will modify the data without starting a transaction. And you, there are two ways of opening this object. One is for read, read-only access, which is faster and, and simpler. And, and, and uh, a open for read will just give you back a const pointer to your object. And you can read it. Right? Uh, and it's a, it's a fast thing. Um, open for write, on the other hand, clones the object. It gives you a private copy. So an atomic object has to be clonable, has to have value semantics, um, and has to be copyable. So the system actually clones the object for you. And you have to make sure that an atomic object is clonable. So since you are oper inside a transaction, you can really modify these uh, shadow objects, the ones that you opened for write. These you can modify. And, uh, and of course, nobody else sees your modifications until you commit the transaction at the end of the atomic block. There's a commit, and then these shadow objects are put back in memory. Yes? <laughs> no, they have to be clonable in the deep sense. So value semantics, right? Value semantics. We've talked about value semantics a lot. Um, OK, so here's an example. It's a trivial example. I'll, I'll, I'll come up with better examples later. Uh, so you, we have, you have a struct foo that contains an integer but you declare it's an atomic struct. Define it's an atomic struct, so it becomes an atomic object. Am I running over? No. no. Oh. <laughs> um, so how do you initialize? Uh, well, you can only use it through handles. So um, you, uh, a handle is just atomic foo f. That's a handle to, to foo. Maybe we'll have we'll come up with different notation. I don't know. This is all prototype uh, design. Um, so you initialize this handle, and you can't do anything with this handle anymore, right? Um, 
except in a, inside the transaction. So you, you enter a transaction, and now you can open this handle for write. And what you get is a copy of foo. And on this copy of foo, you perform plus plus. So you just, you can do anything. You can call a function that modifies uh, foo. You, you can, um, any modifications are allowed. There's no uh, con contractual uh, you, you can do anything, right? So you can call library functions, for instance. Now, about cloning, that probably answers your question a little bit. Deep cloning, you have to do the deep copy. Uh, now, what does deep copy mean for atomic objects? Uh, atomic objects m uh, may, may contain handles to other objects. Like you have a linked list, then actually the pointer to the next object will be a, an atomic handle because you want to be able to lock links. That, that will be an example I give. Um, so when you copy something that contains inside atomic handles, you just copy these handles. It doesn't mean you clone the object. Okay, so these handles are totally opaque. You don't know that there is an object behind them. You just copy them as regular things. And, and you, might, you, you might worry about, uh, okay, so I, I'll be copying humongous data structures when, when I clone. When I do any, any transaction, I will be cloning like trees or linked lists. No, it, it, it doesn't work this way. You, you um, design your objects with, with low granularity. So for instance, every node in a tree will be an atomic object. Every node in a linked list will be an atomic object. So you'll be cloning only a single node or multiple nodes if you are following some path. And what, what we need to make this all foolproof is support from the type system. This is very important that we actually have a language in which we can ask uh, Walter to provide support. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, So, so we have this new uh, atomic keyword, which will also serve as a type. Um, and when, when we mark a, a struct or a class as atomic, then all its methods become atomic. All its functions become atomic. What does it mean that the function is atomic? It means it cannot be called uh, outside of any transaction. And the type system can enforce this. Um, open and open write, these two ways of opening uh, an, an object, an atomic object, can also be called only inside a transaction. And this is also something that a compiler can enforce. No opening objects outside of a transaction, right? And, And what it means inside a transaction. This is the, the, way, the recursive nature. Well, inside an atomic block, you can open a, um, an object, uh, a handle inside an atomic block. But from an atomic block, you can call an atomic function. And so you can also open an object from an atomic function. Because an atomic function, again, can only be called from an atomic block or another atomic function. So that's a re recursive uh, thing. Uh, no, no. Uh, if, if atomic becomes part of the signature, part of the type of the function, then you can enforce it on pointers yeah. to functions, too. Yeah. But not, not any pointers, but you have, yeah. Um, okay, so this is where the type system will help us to write foolproof <coughs> programs. 
and we'll make concurrent programming a piece of cake. So here's an example of singly linked list. How does this really work? How do you design these things? Okay, so we will have two objects, list and no. Um, list doesn't have to be atomic. Um, uh, it, although it actually has all, all the methods are atomic except for the constructor. The constructors are never atomic because they don't, don't, don't have to be. Right? And the list contains uh, a single handle to an atomic object, which is the head. But, but notice atomic in front of it means it's a handle. So this is a handle. It, you cannot do anything with this handle other than open it, right? And it has methods, like uh, if you want to access a handle, you can do this. Uh, but you can only access it through an atomic function, a, a atomic method. See, L look at the atomic at the end of this. Um, and uh, it will return you a const pointer to a node object. So you can read this, right? <coughs> but you cannot call it only inside a transaction. Uh, and there are methods insert and remove that are also atomic. And uh, I will show the implementation of in uh, first uh, the implementation of the node. Well, the node contains the value, of course, and link to the next. Node. And this link is also the, the, instead of a pointer, we have a handle to the next node because the next node is also atomic. So we can only have an, a handle to it. So atomic S node means that's a handle to S node. And it's called next. Okay? And there we have the methods. Um, value, for instance. Um, uh, not, notice that this structure is atomic, so all these methods are automatically atomic, except for the constructor. They're automatically at atomic, which means value being atomic cannot be called for, from anywhere other than uh, transaction. Yes? Next is a point. Last line? Well, um, that's, that's a matter of notation. This is a handle. So a handle implies a pointer inside, sort of. Well, not, not really. It's an opaque type. It's an op opaque handle. You can only open it, and then you get a pointer. See? It's hiding a pointer, really. No, I do next open always. Next open. That returns a pointer. Yeah, think about it from a memory perspective. Uh -huh. Simply from a memory layout perspective of the thing that is struct test next. Okay. That declaration looks to me like it includes in itself the memory layout for struct test next. So the storage for a struct test oh, okay. next. Yeah, okay. Well, I think you need it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a matter of notation. Um, do we want to put a star there or not? Atomic is special, yes, absolutely. Atomic means it's a handle. Okay. Atomic in front of it What's means it's a handle. I mean, we can, we can have, you know, maybe we could have um, atomic with bang, open parentheses, the type, or something like that. Yeah. Okay, so to get value, uh, you just return value, but it's an atomic method, to, so you can only access the value inside an atomic block. You can't read the value outside because of concurrency problems, right? Um, then you have the method next, which actually uh, gives you read access to the next pointer, to the next object, which returns a pointer to the next object. 
and you have a method set next which will actually modify something so it has to open this to for writing which means it creates a clone of itself and on this clone it can set next and, and one interesting thing is that uh, you can use a const pointer to, to S node uh, to initialize a handle because that once the object is inside a handle, it's, it's really const. It will never change, right? So the only way of changing is actually clone it and change the clone. But the object that sits inside the handle is, is technically <laughs> never changed. So you can initialize it with a const object. OK. <clears throat> so starting with the use case, atomic my list insert x transaction you know transaction inside you do insert so we are inside a transaction when, when we are calling insert and insert uh, well I don't have to say it's atomic because it's a, it's a method of an atomic object but it's an atomic method right <coughs> and it will just go through the linked list following the linked list oh it's a linked list with sentinels so um, this code is simple um, <coughs> to make this code simple, it just contains sentinels on the left and on the right. Um, so, what, yes? Is the atomic on the block necessary, or does it mean that you leave it off if it's on the side of the atomic? In other words, do you need the atomic on the function name and on the block when you call it, or is the point of the point of on the block when you call it means to be transactional? And if you left off, if you left off the atomic on the first line, would on the first the line? Copy? Um, if you left atomic, it, it just wouldn't compile, right? So you need the atomic width at the call point yes. and the definition. Yes, these are different things. There are, there are th three ways of using atomic. Okay. Uh, to, to start a transaction, um, for, uh, to make an atomic object, and uh, to, for a handle, to create a handle. Okay. Handle is marked by atomic. Okay, that might be a little bit confusing, but there are three three ways of using atomic. <coughs> Inside an atomic block, you could put, you know, insert and then remove in another insert, another remove, a bunch of things, and they will all happen in one transaction atomically. So this is just the simplest case when you do one one operation in, the, in this transaction. So you traverse the linked list, and when you traverse the linked list, you have to read the values, okay? And every time you read the value, um, you have to open the object for, for read, which is just simply open. I call it open. That's, that's for read. So you open an object that reads, look at its value, uh, and continue until you find the object that in front, uh, after which you are supposed to insert yourself, the previous object. And then you, um, and then you call set next on this object, which will open it for writing and initialize it, its pointer. The, it's a pretty straightforward thing, except for these opens that happen in various places. So if you want to access the object, you have to open it. If you want to modify it, you have to open for write. So this is a, a, a new paradigm, and it takes some getting used to it. But essentially, looking at this example, you would probably be able to design a tree, design a, you know, a bunch of other data structures easily. OK. <laughs> Four o'clock, huh? The rest is implementation. <laughs> okay, let me just maybe give you a, a general idea how this stuff is implemented. Well, first of all, um, atomic object um, has has to um, f has to contain a version number. Okay so that we know what version of the object we are dealing with. 
And these version numbers are used uh, later in the read check. When you do a read check, you just look, what are the objects that I've opened for reading or for writing to? Okay? What are these objects? Um, you, have, you, have, you have them logged in your, re in your log. So you go in, in the commit phase, you go through all of them and look at the version number that you stored compared with the version number uh, in memory. That's your read check. Okay. Um, this uh, version number, uh, in the same word as you store version number, you also store one bit, that, which serves as a lock. So version number is always even, and the last bit is free to use as a lock. Uh, this is very important to squeeze the whole thing into one word because most of these operations will be lock-free. They, they can operate on words, and, the, and they use the compare and store instruction, you know, so you can compare and store a word in one atomic operation. <coughs> Plus, in, in this particular implementation, you have a global version clock, so all threads take the version, current version from this global variable, and since it's done using, again, using CAS operation, uh, it's uh, it's really not, um, a, it's a very fast operation, so there's very little contention for the global lock, uh, global clock, right? So when you start a transaction, you read the global clock and you say, okay, I, wa I want to have a snapshot of memory, whatever I read has to be less or equal to this clock, to, to this version, right? So every time you, you make a read, you check, Okay, what's the version of this object here? What's the uh, version of this object? Is it less or equal? Then it's fine. If it's greater than what I'm holding, it means, oops, somebody modified it after I started my transaction. Abort. Don't worry about anything else. You don't have a consistent snapshot. You should not prog pr progress. Right? Now, when you enter the um, commit phase, you first thing that you do, you lock all your write locations using this bit in every object. So every object that's, that's been cloned, you have to lock it in memory because you'll be swapping back, right? After you've locked all your, all your write set, then you do the read check. And the trick is that you actually can do read check without locking the, re the read set. And I'm not going to go into the details, although it's a very interesting concept that you, you actually do this uh, without locking. So you have, you have the right set locked for, for the duration of read check. And then once the read check uh, succeeded, uh, then you simply write these things, the, this, these cloned objects back into their locations and unlock them, unlock them. And the other thing is you give them a new version number. So you, you, you probe the clock and you see what's the current version, plus one, increment the global clock, and stick the new version in your object. So if anybody else is doing a transaction and they read something and say, oops, that's a, that's a version higher than what I was thinking, and they will abort. Yes? So what was the of the clock? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that takes a little bit of effort. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in in general, it could be solved uh, by uh, from time to time just right. aborting all the transactions. When when the clock le reaches its maximum, the system would just abort all the transactions and restart the clock. You can always abort transactions, you know, so it's not a big deal. Yes. Absolutely. If you have a very close yeah. range transaction, mm -hmm. you have to roll back an awful lot of state. You really want to minimize it. Yes. So that means that atomic functions need to stay short. Mm -hmm. Ideally, if mm -hmm. it's a big function, you break it up. But especially atomic objects should stay small, right? 
atomic objects would be tiny things. Yeah, um, the, the length of execution, well. Well, that, that could be the test our patience. You have one that, that cost data, that's when numbers arise, which then you might more often have to uh, cancel the transaction. So it almost seems like. Yeah, if you have one transaction that takes very long time, and then you have a lot of short transactions that bang in the same data, yeah, they might starve you. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. yeah. So, so if you have a really long... But I, I wouldn't mix them in one piece of code. Well, that's, that's exactly the question. If you, have, if you have a long section of code, then why wouldn't you want to lock that? And then, I, I mean, I don't know how people would fix that. If you, if you most, of, most of the answer to this is incredibly application specific. So it's hard to say in this yeah. case what you would do. But usually when you lock stuff, it's for a short duration, right? So the same applies here. I mean, if you have to do a very, very long operation, you probably should not, you should probably redesign your data structures, right? <laughs> okay. That's a very good question, yes. Um, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so for instance, the, the, it's interesting, the, the Haskell implementation of this uh, is interesting because they actually have, can prevent uh, I.O. from inside atomic blocks because I.O. operations are members of an I.O. monad and um, STM is a separate monad. So from inside an STM monad, you cannot call I.O. monad. Right, like like launching missiles. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when, even though it's a speculative execution of the scout, the missile, when it's launched in speculative way, it will actually hit the target. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then um, the next operation within the block fails. We want to um, st uh, step back, retry, but problem is the um, memory is already gone, allocated by another application. What are you doing? Well, free wouldn't be an atomic function. You couldn't really call that from within an atomic block. You would have to so convert that. You so couldn't create a new object? Right, right. Garbage, but we take care of it. But yeah. There are implementations that do take delete into account. Uh, yeah, having garbage collection is actually a great help for STM. That's, that's why I think STM will have a very hard time getting into C++. I haven't studied object-based uh, transaction memory that much. I have studied word-based. In word-based, freeing is simple because it's tracking the same memory all the time. So it'll track all of the written to internal tracking bits of the memory as well so that it can actually roll back if it needs to, or never commit when it needs to. So it would basically defer the free as if it was a write. Yeah, because yeah. it is a write. It's just writing right, to yeah. data you don't really typically think about. Right. Mm -hmm. But you would have to instrument free. Yeah, they have to be instrumented. Yeah. yeah. Atomic so it would be at atomic free. Yeah. The garbage collection methodology just yes. in reference yeah. and go away eventually. Yeah. There were actually some problems with mixing as um, STM with uh, malloc and free uh, things, and uh, this this particular approach with the, the one with the uh, it's called uh, uh, maybe I should I should show you uh, what are the two main papers. The two main papers are Dice, Shalev, and Shavit 
that it's called transactional locking two. This is where I took the implementation from. I, I, um, I studied a, a lot of other implementations, but this is the latest one which actually solves a lot of problems that the previous one had. And one of them was mixing malloc with uh, garbage collection. They solved this problem very nicely. Yes, yeah. I'll link to the website referred to the uh, Right, and, and, and another paper is, is the, the this, this is the one uh, about Has Haskell, which, uh, uh, whose implementation actually shows all these um, interesting things like com composable transactions. Um, this one also talks about retry, introduces retry, and, and monads. I mean, anybody here fluent in Haskell? <laughs> yes? Okay. The one I haven't shown yet? Oh, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> so what, what we have done so far, we have a C implementation which we actually got from these guys, <coughs> right, and GPL. And, and Brad ported it. BSD? Okay. It's been a while since I've looked. Okay, okay. I, I, for me, it's just a TLA. <laughs> um, so we have this code, uh, but um, of course we would prefer to implement in D, maybe even from scratch. Uh, and of course, uh, we are counting on <laughs> Walter. <laughs> to modify the type system even more. To clarify bullet one a little bit more, the Sun guy wrote a complete implementation of C, but it uses Sun assembly, or Spark assembly rather. Uh, so I've done a port up three quarters done to uh, x86 assembly. There's a few instructions that x86 doesn't support that Sun used, like a non-throwing, or non-faulting uh, uh, memory lookup. So if the memory would normally set fault, it doesn't. Yeah, uh, but it's... it's does not exist next These are probably some optimizations. Yeah. But in general, all this stuff can be implemented with the hardware support. Um, the, the, the only hardware support needed is, is CAS, yeah. compare and store. That's yeah, all the we The implementation need. goes well beyond what they talk about in the paper in yeah. terms of micro-optimizing little things. Um, yeah. Oh, the, the key here is optimization. The implementation itself is pretty simple, but once you start optimizing it, it gets hairy. Okay? Well, thank you.